Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Fifty years ago, John Osborne was heralded as the savior of the English drama. Our guest has written a compelling biography of this artist, chronicling, chronicling his meteoric rise to fame, his amazing success, and his rather distressing descent into a life of troubled romances and substance abuse. Here to introduce our guest, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. <laughs> Substance abuse. It's a good thing John Osborne's dead, so we can't be sued after that introduction. <laughs> oh, I don't we could. <laughs> but he was a fascinating man with a very colorful life, and he was absolutely crucial to the uh, uh, playwriting and modern drama as we know it today. Uh, his life has been chronicled really compellingly, as Susan says, by John Halpern, who is the drama critic for the New York Observer. Welcome to Theater Talk, and congratulations on the book, John Osborne, The Many Lives of the Angry Young Man. Welcome. Yeah, thanks. Um, if you can, um, John, sort of give us a sense of what the theater in Britain was like in the 50s at the time that Osborne burst on the scene with Look Back in Anger and how that just completely shifted everything in the theater then. Sure, it was, it was rather like today, it was boring. <laughs> and uh, basically what happened was that uh, Osborne, through Jimmy Porter, mm -hmm. bought, the main character, yeah. uh, the main character of Look Back in Anger, his anti-hero, he brought emotion to the English psyche and the English stage. Mm -hmm. God forbid an Englishman should express any emotion about anything. Mm -hmm. And so for the first time in history, you had a man who talked and spewed bile from the gut about the state of England, the state of his life. Mm -hmm. It was the first time it had happened. Noel Coward didn't do that. Right, right. And right. it was a theater of people like Terence Radigan, Noel Coward's, Somerset Maugham revivals, all beautiful drawing rooms and people well-dressed. T.S. Eliot verse plays, yeah. Douglas Hume-like comedies. They were all middle-class drawing room plays. Mm -hmm. No lower-class people actually appeared on the stage. Can you imagine that? Really? Well, they were maids. Maid, they yeah. play maids, you see, and right. they'd come in, you know, with a rather accent, saying, uh, "Can I be off home now?" <laughs> and that was called working class, you see. <laughs> right. and, and and one of the things I found, which is actually quite fascinating, way into the subject, was that in those days, the reps, the repertory companies of England, were in every city. In the 1950s. Yeah, yeah. and they're the backbone of, of really English theatre. And in those days, if you played in a modern play, you had to bring your own costume. <laughs> yes. So if you played a period play, well, they gave you, you know, the doublet to play <laughs> Shakespeare and the sword. Right. But if you, if you went along, you, you had to have your own costumes. Mm. And, and that uh, required you to have uh, uh, evening wear. Mm -hmm. A uh, cocktail dress, a tennis outfit, <laughs> and uh, that was the outfit and, of the actor. <laughs> and jodhpurs. And right there, it tells you <laughs> what you were seeing on stage. You weren't seeing a working man on the stage. Mm -hmm. New, New York theatre had them, yeah. obviously, with yeah. group theatre. Yeah. Willie Loman, a low man. Mm -hmm. uh, the tender mercies of, of uh, Tennessee Williams. They were a different. They were ahead of England, which only proves you how isolated this little island was and still is. Now I have to ask you about Look Back mm -hmm. in Anger because when you, I watched the movie the other day with Richard Burton and I was struck by similarities between that movie and as you point out in the book, A Streetcar Named yeah. Desire. Yeah. Yeah. Was, uh, Osborne knew what was happening in American theater, did he, when he wrote this? He had read his Tennessee Williams, yeah. he read Miller. Um, he hadn't been to New York to see these plays, but no. he knew what was going on? He hadn't been, uh, by the time of Look Back in Anger in 1956, he'd never been anywhere mm, yeah, except sure. around England yeah. as, a, as a second rate actor. Yeah. Uh, when uh, Look Back in Anger made him famous overnight, he was still delivering the mail every Christmas <laughs> to earn a cent or two, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yes, he was, because his great hero was Tennessee Williams, mm -hmm. little known fact for, uh, uh, for some reason, but, but he made no s secret of it. He said he would sooner uh, the plays of Tennessee Williams 
and I'm quoting him, than a, than a thousand statements from a thousand politicians. Mm -hmm. So his admiration of Williams, uh, with whom he, first of all, he loved his plays, second of all, he rather liked the depressive side of Williams. He liked his, uh, the bluesy side of him. Mm -hmm. uh, but he based the, uh, the outer plot of Look Back in, in Anger is, is based on Williams' streetcar. Absolutely, yeah. Well, but in, in Look Back in Anger, we have this anti-hero, as you say, Jimmy mm. Porter, who's uh, very distressed about his own plight, which is considered to be analogous to the state of England in a way you can explain. Yeah. Is it not? I'll have a back. Have a back. <laughs> you know, he also yeah. is a Jimmy Porter, a, a wife beater, as was Osborne, and quite a, a, quite a swine. And what? I found myself. <laughs> What's I found going on? My, I found myself wondering. Susan, put yourself been, together. Had there been huh? female drama critics in 1950 in England, would this play have gone over as well? Although many drama critics didn't like it, but you know, this this the behavior of this person now. You think, well, he would merely be, be arrested, and she would file a restraining order and that would be the end of it but you know it's quite uh, rough on women that play are you done yep uh, well, <laughs> well you're, you're, you're probably right but you uh, uh, so is uh, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf it's not unusual for marriages to be in turmoil and it's not unusual for, for eruptions of fury to take place right I don't think that Osborne, the reason that the play became such a legend and changed so many things, surely, Susan, is because it actually locked into how people felt. And if they didn't feel that way, if they couldn't identify with the play, we would never have heard of the play or John mm. Osborne. Uh, in fact, the play, you're quite right, it, it wouldn't matter. Yes, all, all, the, all the critics then were, were guys. Uh, in fact, there were still very few uh, female drama critics anyway. Yep. Uh, and uh, most of them, the vast majority of them, hated the play. Uh, so there you are. So, you know, they hated the play because they couldn't see its relevance. They were used to a different form. They were used to Terence Rattigan. They weren't used to that kind of emotional fury and class anger. How was that an analogy for the state of England? Uh, because of the, the fundamental uh, fury of the play is about the class war. It's about class war, it's about marital war, mm -hmm. it's about sex war. It's a potent brew. And no one had talked about the underclass of England before and the fury at the ruling elites for keeping them down. Nobody thought that way in theatre. Along comes Osborne himself, the son of a barmaid, mm -hmm. and uh, he lets them have it. He comes out swinging, and England identified with that. Mm. That's the point. Throughout the book, he's swinging. I mean, even when he's achieved success, he's swinging, not necessarily always beating them up, but swinging mm -hmm. at the many wives he has. He's swinging at his friends. He's breaking off friendships, disrupting relationships with people, sending letters, damn you, the famous damn you England letter. Yeah. That anger, when you look at his background and his psychology, what was at the root of that fury all the time about life? Well, it's a very good question. Um, but. Uh, I think you, you, I'm not so sure you can actually say, well, this is the reason. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned his fury at the marriages. His fury came when the marriage failed. Mm -hmm. It wasn't particularly, I mean, it was lovey dovey when it began. Right. You know, uh, he hated things to go wrong. A lot of people are like that, so he blamed everyone except himself, of course. <laughs> yes. And uh, his fury at uh, the Damn You England letter was actually over its support of the nuclear bomb. Right. It was a, a hysterical uh, letter of a certain Swiftian turn of phrase mm -hmm. that he wrote for a left-wing uh, paper called Tribune. And it was published there, and it said, damn all the politicians who are sending us to our graves, more or less. One uh, could write that letter today. And, well, who would publish it today? <laughs> and which playwright would write it? Mm -hmm. um, but it had an effect because it galvanized the opposition. Osborne himself wasn't a political man. He was an emotional man, mm -hmm. as you sensed. And, uh, and in fact, it's rather unfortunate that he wrote 
the letter from the south of France where he was sunning himself. <laughs> That's right. with, a bit of a problem. With, with, with his mistress of the day, <laughs> uh, actually. But, but there we are. It's just a postal mark, isn't it? <laughs> you mentioned his barmaid mother. Yeah, sure. Uh, and a sort of superficial analysis of possibly part of his problem might be that he was in this very. Uh, he was with this poor, apparently very uh, verbose and difficult woman. Then the father was absent a great deal of the time in his childhood, mm. sort of, and he never could break with her. And then he seemed to recreate, recreate over and over again through his wife. What, six wives? Five wives or five, six just wives? The, five, just, just, the five. Five. just five. Just five. <laughs> he kept recreating these relationships of this tempestuousness with women just mm. over and over again. It's remarkable, you know, the way he, he had to keep installing someone in that slot of some woman to be having a very troubled time with. And mm. uh, so one would look maybe to the relationship with the mother as being a catalyst. Only if you're a psychologist. Yes, or, well, or, 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 or a crypto Freudian is, like me. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But it's, so it's just that, that I tend to avoid a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but you he, lay out the facts beautifully he, in your thank book. Thank you. He hated his mother. Yep. Yeah. And and was uh, at the same time cared for her, kept her in in near luxury really, or um, took him to took her to his opening night parties. Did more than a devoted son would even do. But he hated her. There's no question. She was. Uh, she meant well. Uh, uh, she was a put-down artist. She put him down. If you read the letters in the book that I came across uh, in the, during research, it's obvious that she can't help herself. She put him down since a little boy. Mm -hmm. uh, the father was absent, uh, partly because they were semi-divorced, and he died when John Osborne was uh, 10, I yeah, think. Yeah. Uh, which is also a story told in Look Back in Anger, an autobiographical play as first plays often are. But I have a correction that I'm longing to make to your uh, feeling that he was this terrible, angry, furious misogynist. First of all, he struck everyone who knew him as an extremely gentle man. Yes, you say that a lot, yeah. Uh, and a courteous man and a caring man. Secondly, all his wives, all five of them, uh, were very intelligent, independent women. Yes. And in their own way, feminist, actually. Uh, the first was a, an un, a now unknown actress called Pamela Lane who left him. Mm -hmm. she, she upped and left. She thought it was boring, <laughs> banging on all day about changing the world, you see. <laughs> Uh, the, the second wife was a, a beauty called Mary Orr, the film star, and uh, who had mental she, problems. She had her own problems. She ran off with Robert Shaw, which ignited other problems, and uh, alas, she died quite young. But, but at the time, she was quite a. Uh, she wasn't a simpering starlet. She was quite an independent woman. Uh, the third, Penelope Gilliatt, film critic of the London Observer, mm -hmm. my old paper, mm -hmm. and latterly for the New Yorker, was a deeply intelligent woman. Brilliant woman. And brilliant, right? Yep. Uh, Jill Bennett, wife number four, <laughs> highly independent, highly dangerous woman who did more wreckage in their marriage on average. Yes, the mother's than letters had did. nothing on Jill Bennett. No, not no. at all. See? Yeah. So, and the fifth wife, uh, was a friend of mine, Helen Osborne, uh, Helen Dawson it was, who was arts editor at the London yes. Observer, which is how come I was asked to do this. And that was a happy marriage that lasted for 17 years. So I, I just put that to balance well, no, out. And I'm You're writing what you say, but, in, but you know, he was a complicated puppy. Com complicated, but Absolutely. I'm just saying this, you know. this com the repeating of the, the marriages, except for the last mm. marriage, when primarily the three that were he, there a certain hatred would set in and then mm. he just replaced the wife sort of without the insight that if you repeat the pattern of the same behavior this, this same thing is likely to happen again yes there was a circularity I mean I did that. wonder and then I'll stop two things I wondered yes and this was mostly in the 70s we're talking the 60s 70s. I thought number one don't these people know about therapy a and mm. two Osborne, literally, <laughs> from from your book, he is drinking 
every day he's taking amphetamines, he's taking Valium, and then he's writing this in his journals. Oh, you I'm see, so unhappy. Everyone is drinking. You see, no, he's no. a completely normal human being. No. <laughs> what's, what's, you, no, one, no one even today takes Valium? No, no, no of, course they, uh, of course they do. But yeah. my point is that he, that he was drinking very heavily. It was normal. All day, every yeah. day. And then never, right, very right, right, little right. seemed to be saying, this is my problem. It was always this woman is my problem, mm -hmm. my career is my problem. He was never, there was no insight in people saying, hey, maybe the, the fact that you drink a couple of three or three bottles of booze a day is your problem. Well, <laughs> the, the, reverse, the reverse side of this uh, <laughs> um, attack is yes. that uh, <laughs> you, you have to remember that all these independent, beautiful, deeply intelligent women, including several mistresses, uh, uh, fell for him. Yes, clearly. Why would they charm. fall for such a monster? Can you, can you answer me well, that question? Well, that's why I was saying before we unless, started to go, I would love unless, to see a film of him. Unless they, they didn't find him a monster and unless he wasn't a monster. Now, as for the question of therapy, Therapy to this day, if you mean shrinks, uh, are a yeah. social embarrassment. Or in Buddhism, England. I don't know, you know, something. In England. Yeah. In, in them days, you're talking about the 50s, 60s, 70s, to go to a shrink was, was embarrassing. To go to one here is rather like going to a personal trainer. It makes no difference, does it? That's right. That's but, right. but in England, and I imagine to this day, don't live there anymore, but, but it's, it's, it's not on to see oh. a shrink. Now, what Osborne felt about being shrunk, because he was advised to go uh, and get help uh, for his depressions, yeah. not for, you know, uh, taking a, a whiskey or something. Uh, he didn't need help for that. He's one of the generation that drank, like Burton, like O'Toole, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like Richard Harris. The, the, like all of Fleet Street. They're, they're like all of Fleet Street, except uh, for, for me. And, uh, <laughs> and they, they drank. Uh, he wasn't a violent, horrible drunk, incidentally. He just sipped um, champagne most of the day, hmm. actually, from about 11 to bedtime. Sounds rather nice to me. Didn't he have a concern, though, that he couldn't write the way he wrote? if he did too much of uh, therapy yes. and psychology. Yes, Michael, it's, ah. a, it's, it's, it's a common belief amongst uh, all artists that if, if they are shrunk, they are robbed of their creative impulse. They mm -hmm. don't wish to know what motivates them, what, what, what the creative spark is. They don't want to be shrunk in size. Mm -hmm. And a lot of artists feel that, they feel that uh, you know, their art is God-given and don't mess around with it. He wasn't that unhappy, you know. <laughs> I mean, why are you making him out to be the misery of the century? Because I read he this was the fabulous... Most, he was the most successful <laughs> playwright in England. Fabulous book. God love us. I, so I, now, that we're, now that we've laid him out on the couch, we should, Susan, should have been... the other thing, why are you taking over the show? Poor old Michael. <laughs> he, can't, he can't get away so, right, I'm not going to say another word. I was I want, led to believe. All right, go on. <laughs> I want to bring this back to yeah. the... You the keep going, Susan. The, 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 yeah. the, the plays, the plays of John Osborne. Oh, them, yeah. After Look Back in Anger yeah. comes The Entertainer. Yes. And what is fascinating about that, a couple of things. One is it shows you how deeply in love with the music hall that John Osborne was. Mm. Why, how, how was the music hall so important to him? I mean, did, did he grow up going to those things? What was that? Why did that play such a key role in the way he saw his art and the way he structured his plays? It's central yeah. to, to, to how he's, to, certainly to the entertainer, which is about a failed musical comic who's a metaphor for England, the failure of England, really, second rate nation after being so powerful. And it's a brilliant metaphor, and that's why the play, with all its flaws, works so well, although you need an Olivier yeah. to, to make it work, of mm. course. Uh, but the musical central to him, because that was the first experience he had of theatre. Mm -hmm. And I think that musical has, I caught them just uh, uh, old enough to know that I caught the tail end of musical, and it's a great shame. Mm. that nobody, uh, no young person will ever know what it, what it was. What it was was dangerous, witty, politically incorrect, Susan. Um, <laughs> and, and it was uh, utterly spontaneous, utterly charming. 
It, it had small uh, dialogues in it that were little plays. Mm -hmm. It was very sexy. Uh, uh, transvestites, you know, were wonderful on the music hall stage and indeed in most of England. Can I just say my favorite what? song from the music halls that yeah. you point out in the book is Nobody Loves a Fairy When She's 40. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and uh, the first time I heard that uh, at Blackpool, Northern Seaside Resort, I was with my parents, I was about six, and I, I laughed so much because I had no idea a fairy could be 40 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and I was so pleased my parents got the joke. It's true. When, when Osborne <laughs> writes The Entertainer, yes. he and the royal court, where it's done, <laughs> go out and they yeah. get Laurence Olivier to go into this part. Now, Laurence Olivier is now identified with this part. It was considered mm. a great part, but it was a a sh shocking move for Olivier at that point in his career and what he was doing to this part, to do mm. this part, was it not? I think it was a brilliant move of, of his. Mm -hmm. uh, he asked to do it. Mm. He asked Osborne, he jumped on the bandwagon of mm. the Royal Court Theatre uh, that, that really came to life with Look Back in Anger and then when the floodgates were open, all the new drama came in, all the new working class drama. Mm. It became the place to be, the Royal Court Theatre. And Olivier was then 50 yeah. and hadn't been out of tights for about 20 years. <laughs> uh, he, he went uh, with Arthur Miller, and that's the story, and it's a true story. Arthur Miller was in town with Marilyn Monroe, mm -hmm. his then wife, making a movie called Prince and the Showgirl. And uh, Olivier looked up, the great American playwright, and he said, what would you like to see? And uh, Arthur Miller said, uh, well, I haven't a clue, but this play called Look Back in Anger, he liked the title. Mm -hmm. Now, Olivier had seen Look Back in Anger and hated it. Mm -hmm. He thought it betrayed England, because Olivier kind of spoke for England in a way. Yeah. It was a sort of secular king. Yeah. And Henry V? Yes, yeah. that's right. And so he, he'd saved England at the Battle of Agincourt, and now he's about saving them from this horrible kitchen sink drama. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, but anyway, he went again, and Arthur Miller adored the play. Mm -hmm. So he said, oh, I've got it all wrong, he mm -hmm. said to himself. So he went backstage, and he said, have you got anything for me to, to John Osborne? He was taken aback, naturally, and in awe of this great figure. And uh, he didn't write the play for him, but George Devine, who ran the Royal Court, quickly gave it Olivier. And so he, he, he was the first of the great theatrical knights in England to see the new wave drama and to see its potential and its new audiences. So he jumped on the bandwagon and he made that role his own and he became equally famous, at least in England, for, for all the great classical roles and Archie Rice. Right. Because there was uh, the greatest classical actor of the 20th century uh, suddenly singing and dancing as a, uh, and, and cracking bad jokes as a failed musical comic. Yeah. Oh. We ha I, I do want to deal with though, what happened to John Osborne at the end of his life because it's mm. really quite horrifying and, and sad. Mm. How do you account for it? How do you account for the man who sends, the man who wrote these groundbreaking plays, mm. who was the most famous dramatist of his day, mm. at the end of his life sends a letter to his agent and says, I realize now I have to take anything that you can get me to write. Mm. I'm, I'm a, you know, a writer for hire now because mm. he's broke and he's squandered it all. I mean, that's just awful and terrible and tragic. How did he end up like that? Uh, well, the most, I, I think that theater is an incredibly punishing profession and all dramatists go out of fashion sooner or later. They're uh, all replaced by a new generation. Osborne replaced his generation, mm -hmm. and Osborne in turn was replaced by the new generation. What was the play that he failed with? I mean, can you it see? Called, it was called Deja Vu. Yeah, the last And play. that was his last play. Yeah. And he was still swinging in it, you'll be glad to know. Yeah. Uh, but it didn't quite work. The punches didn't land this time. He'd lost his uh, audience. Yeah. And he. He was, he was a, a 62 when, oh. when that came out. Yeah. You see. And he's still an icon of England. Right, right. They still went to see the play. They still talked about him. They didn't identify with what he had to say. He still kept writing. Mm -hmm. He wrote his private journals. He wrote his uh, journalism. He wrote a marvelous uh, autobiography of his early years. The less good second, but it doesn't matter. He kept writing. 
Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, his day had, had been. Mm -hmm. uh, it came again only last year. And he didn't save his money. I mean, he lived grandly his whole life once he got Yes, rich. he was a multimillionaire, yeah. principally, and not just from the worldwide uh, uh, sales of his plays, but, but also through the movie Tom Jones, yeah. which he yeah. co-owned with uh, Tony the director Richardson. Tony Richardson, and he was showered with money and thus spent it. <laughs> what is the last letter he leaves for his wife when he, uh, just before he dies? Uh, it wasn't. A, it was last word. Uh, uh, it was the last words he wrote was on a cigarette pack in, in hospital, and the words were, "I have sinned." Oh. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, it's you a. Could, uh, <laughs> you've got to forgive him, Susan. I do. I'm sorry, John. I know you've been so I'm hard sorry, on him. Sorry, John. Listen, John. It's a wonderful, wonderful biography <laughs> of um, a fascinating. Fascinating Man, John Osborne, The Many Lives of the Angry Young Man, written by John Halpern, the drama critic for the New York Observer. Thanks a lot for being our guest, and thanks for bringing John Osborne back to the center stage. Thank you. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Playbill Online is the official website of Theatre Talk and the home of the Playbill Club, providing information and opportunities for theatre lovers. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>